Good morning, day 71 of the 75 day challenge. Um, just wrapping up my walk for the day. I got a message yesterday from a potential Turo host and they were asking me what is my take on how Turo is currently and just kind of what my opinion was. Um, and usually on my channel, I try to stay away from really talking about the negatives or focusing on the negatives, but I do want to share my real opinion on Turo and I guess what my thoughts are with how they've been throughout this crisis that their entire community is facing. Um, truthfully, I think that it's been a horrible response, actually quite shocking at how little communication we have received from them as a host communi community, how little support we've received from them. And it's just, I don't know, I, I really don't even know how to put words to it. Um, really disappointing and disheartening to say the least. And you know, again, I've been a host on the platform since they were Relay Rides. So since 2015 actually, um, for quite some time. And it's just, I find it interesting. Um, you know, I was like going through my Gmail inbox today and if you click on the little tab that says promotions, that's usually where like any advertising from brands gets filtered out to. And if you go look in that inbox of yours under promotions, you'll see almost on a weekly basis um, brands that you are familiar with or that you purchase products through or that you work with emailing at least once a week just reaching out and even if their messages are as simple as like hey we're here we still want to hear from you during these times this is what we're doing with our company culture i mean there's just some form of communication and i think that that has been pretty close to non-existent with Turo, which is just, it's mind boggling, especially when your platform is based off of your host. If you don't have hosts, you don't have a platform. So you would think that they would go above and beyond um, with really catering to, or at least at the bare minimum, communicating to their host community. And it's just not there. It's just quite literally not there. Um, it's now been a little bit over a month since all of this has been going on. And I think, you know, other than that one sort of email, and even that email came a little too late from the CEO, which really didn't say much in there. Um, there hasn't been much other than that. There was the Powerhost Summit, which was only open to a couple of hundred hosts. So again, it really makes me wonder, like, what does the rest of the community um, think, you know, the rest of the community that there's been absolutely zero communication with. And even during the host summit, there wasn't really anything that was of value that was put out there. In fact, there was quite the opposite. There's some upcoming changes that is going to make being a host even way more difficult than it is now. Um, so yeah, that's my take on it. I I'm very unhappy with what their response has been. I would not have thought that it would have been this terrible and abysmal, but it has. Um, so it's just, it's really disappointing. It is really disappointing. And like I said in the very beginning of all of this, we are going to be each other's help because I don't think that we're going to receive really any type of support from them or even any type of real communication from them. It just seems like they're not designed like that. Their leadership doesn't believe in that they're, and they're not really structured to be that way. Um, one of the things that they talked a lot about during the host summit was really utilizing your dedicated account reps. Um, and I think actually, because I got an email the other day from a new person saying like, oh, hey, I'm gonna be your new rep. Um, I think that actually the person who is my rep is no longer with the company. That's my guess because I tried reaching out to him and I never heard anything back, which again goes to show you that they don't communicate. You would think that if your rep is leaving the company, okay, understandably there's layoffs taking place, they're downsizing, we get it right everyone's in a hard position but you would think that there would be some type of like exit email like hey you know 
this is the current situation, but don't worry, you're gonna be in good hands. This is gonna be your new rep. And it's just, it's amazing to me that they don't do things like that because as a host, you know, they have their reps call you and you spend time building a relationship with them, sharing your story with them. And you know, that's time as a host that you set aside to build that relationship. And then all of a sudden you no longer have that rep and then there's a new rep and then they wanna set up calls and kind of redo the whole thing again. And so, yeah, you would think, you would think that, you know, your outgoing rep, there would be at least some kind of departing message or communication, but there isn't. So again, that goes to show you that that is just how that company flows. And it doesn't look like there's a lot of transparency from the top down. Um, and it reflects in the way that their people communicate. So that is sort of my take on what I think about them and in this current situation. And I think because of this, they are definitely going to feel the effects of it. I think that they are going to lose a lot of hosts. They're not supporting their hosts. And a lot of people are snoozing their listings. They're delisting their cars. They're selling off their cars. They're exiting. And when things do start to bounce, bounce back around, they're going to feel that loss. And I know for them, specifically because of the investors that they do have as a part of their company, their primary goal is to increase supply on the platform. They wanna increase and retain supply because they believe that if there is an abundance of supply, that demand will follow. So I have news for you Turo investors out there. This supply is gonna to continue to deplete because Turo is not doing a good job at communicating with their host or really nurturing their host community at a time like this. And again, we can look at different marketplaces and see how they are reacting um, to the their marketplace communities. Let's take Facebook, for example. They are a community that runs on small businesses advertising and selling on their platform. That is their, a gigantic source of revenue for them. And they have gone above and beyond to provide resources for the small businesses that rely on their platform. They've created funds, they've created advertising incentives. I mean, they've done a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I know I talk about Airbnb a lot, Airbnb, same thing. They had some hiccups in the beginning. They had issues with their hosts, but they still worked through it. They continue to communicate. They were even acknowledged by the White House for the initiative that they put forth uh, for offering up their resources to first responders all across the world. So they're trying and that trying makes a huge difference. And that has been non-existent for Turo. It baffles me that they haven't tried to leverage the resources of their host community to be a pillar, to be an offering to those people who need it the most during this time. There are people who need transportation, especially in the healthcare community, first responders, um, nurses, anyone who's working in medical, people are being mobilized. I shared the other day that I had a renter an RN who flew in from Hawaii so that she can go work at the Riverside um, ICU because Riverside has been hit really hard and she rented my car because she needed transportation. Um, and like I said, there are people being mobilized in all different types of places and industries and they need transportation. If they need housing from a company like Airbnb, then they need transportation. They go hand in hand. Here in California, we don't have a mass transit system. We don't have um, a community that relies on public transportation. Everyone here drives cars, as is the case with many other places like Houston, Miami, like, and right now, especially people, do, and the places that do have mass transit, no one's trying to take mass transit right now. Um, so providing vehicles at a great value to these people is the solution, but, we are not a part of that game plan, at least from Turo's end. So, okay, that's my little rant. I'm gonna stop right there. Happy Wednesday. Hope you guys are all healthy and safe. Um, I don't know, this is just one person's opinion. So let me know what you guys think about all of this and what you guys think about what their response has been thus far. Um, do comment below, I would love to hear it and I think other people would too. All right guys, take care, talk to you soon, bye. 
All right, day 71, reading The Wealthy Gardener and going over the 10 seeds of wealth. The first two seeds was, number one was think wealth, number two was frugality, and today is number three, which is profitability. And I'm going to read you guys the entire lesson because it is so good, but it is also nice and short. So let's get right into it. Profitability, wealth like a tree grows from a tiny seed. George S. Classen. Wealth is built on profitability, said the wealthy gardener. It's the ability to earn money and spend money in a way that results in excess money to save. You're referring to discretionary income, asked Jimmy. Bingo, that's stuff. In a business, an owner who spends profits on luxuries will usually end in failure. In life, the same tendency causes under accumulation. Spending money on non-essential items leads to vulnerability. We need to have excess money to be wealthy. Jimmy thought about it. I think most people get the idea that they need to save and invest money. The common problem is they don't have money at the end of the month. The wealthy gardener frowned. Household economy is the first issue to resolve. It takes a good offense or earning more and it takes a good defense or spending less. The wealthy do both to win. Profits result from a balanced game plan. What if people have, people have a ceiling on income, counter Jimmy? And what if their monthly income barely covers their fixed living expenses? Then they are changed, chained to a life of financial insecurity, said the wealthy gardener. They are prisoners of wage slavery. They live to meet living expenses and to pay taxes. Jimmy sighed, thinking there was no worse fate. What we need are financial constraints, said the wealthy gardener. We need to set aside a portion of every paycheck to create a condition of forced scarcity. This plan reduces our capacity to spend. It is the way to assure the behavior that leads to wealth. Jimmy sighed. I have absolutely no clue what you mean. For example, recall the discussion we had yesterday about earning $25,000 a year? If you could earn no more, don't you think your spending would be different than let's say if you earned $125,000 annually? Jimmy says, I'd admit that's true. Well, the difference in your spending is due to a constraint. When you exist in an environment of economic scarcity, it assures your frugality, right? Yes, Jimmy said sensing he was being led into a trap. The wealthy gardener continued, have you ever heard the phrase pay yourself first? Sure, save first and spend what's left. The reason it works is because it imposes an artificial environment of scarcity. With little money to spend, we clearly choose our needs, not our wants, and somehow we manage to always survive while saving money. You followed this plan? You can be sure of it, said the wealthy gardener. It's the only way to get real money in the bank. It assures we don't fall for Parkinson's law. Jimmy smiled, knowing he was now being baited. What is this law? Glad you asked, said the wealthy gardener with a wry smile. This law says that no matter how much money people earn, they tend to spend the entire amount and a little bit more besides. Their expenses rise in lockstep with their incomes. Many people today earn several times what they earned at their first jobs, but somehow they seem to need every single penny to maintain their current lifestyle, no matter how much they make. There never seems to be enough. It explains why most people are broke. And why spending is the cause of failure, Jimmy said, but paying myself first will create a spending constraint to assure my monthly profitability. Profitability is the ability to generate excess money. Broke people will argue against setting aside money at the start of each month. How can I set aside money at the start of each month, they ask, when I have no money left over at the end of the previous month? It's a logical question, but accumulators think differently than people who are broke. They may set aside $100, for example, and then they incrementally save higher monthly amounts over time. They accept lifestyle changes. They cut back. A lifestyle of financial insecurity must be transformed into a lifestyle that creates monthly profits. But what if I cut back and my income still does not produce enough to save? 
He who will not economize, Confucius said, will have to agonize. Profitability may require earning more. The 40-hour work week is for survival income. Wealth won't grow from minimum efforts. Accumulation requires sacrifice, working smarter, harder, and longer, and this explains its rarity. More income may require working two jobs, pursuing more education to increase earning capacity, or running a side business. If you want more, work more. Work is a surefire monkey-making scheme, said Dave Ramsey. <laughs> monkey-making, I meant to say money-making scheme. <laughs> Without labor, nothing prospers, said Sophocles. But I don't have time to work more, is a common refrain. A television costs you about $40,000 a year, said Jim Rohn. Not to own it, but to watch it. What else could you do with that time? That's a good point for all the people that like to Netflix and chill. How about working, earning, or learning? Time wasted is money lost and wealth abandoned. When we use all of our waking hours, we will have money to save. If we allow our expenses to increase at a slower rate than our incomes, we, and we save or invest the difference, we can become wealthy during our working lifetimes. The life lesson, profitability. I struggled for years with no success in saving until I developed a strong offense and a stingy defense. And that was the life lesson on profitability. And it's so true. You really do just have to get yourself in that habit of saving no matter what your financial situation is. And the rest of it, you'll figure out how to adjust. Um, so that was seed number three to the 10 seeds of wealth, which is just the end portion of this book. And I think I've already kind of skipped ahead and looked at what they are and they're super valuable. So be sure to tune in over the next couple of days as I go over the 10 seeds of wealth from The Wealthy Gardener by John Seferic. Thanks again, guys. Hope you enjoyed watching this video and I will be with you guys tomorrow. A link to this book is down in the description as well as a link to the 75 day challenge. Day 71, done and done. Take care, stay healthy. Bye guys.